Amen. Well, again, thanks for being here. Super excited for today because we are starting a brand new series. Can we make some noise for a new series? Let's go. Just love it. So this series is called Scenes of Sacrifice, okay? Did we know that it was going to be SOS when we titled it? No, okay? But we're here, okay? So Scenes of Sacrifice is our Easter series, uh, and I'm super excited about this because it's Easter, and it's always fun to, to jump into the Easter story. And that's exactly what we're going to do in this series. Um, if you see behind me these very beautiful pictures, okay, uh, we are going to walk through the story of Easter over the next three weeks, okay? And I'll just give you just a little sneak peek, is that each week these pictures are going to be different. So this week we've got our seven, and we're going to walk through these today, and we're going to talk about them and bring out something important that I believe that God has for us uh, in our walks with him and in the Easter story. Next week you'll get a brand new seven, and the week after that on Easter Sunday you'll have a new set of five uh, that are all about the resurrection and what Jesus has done. So very excited about this because it gives us the time and the space to just kind of go through the story of Easter. Is anybody a fan of just stories? Like you just love listening to, reading, watching a story unfold? Well, we get the, I know more of y'all like that. Come on, let's wake up a second. We get the opportunity to watch it all unfold and to, to have good conversation, get into the details of it. So I'm very, very excited for this. Uh, to start it off, we're going to do exactly that. Is we're going to look through the seven scenes that we have with us today. So I'm going to move back here, okay? For our online people, stick with me. I'm going to do my best to not turn my back to anybody. But we're literally going to walk through these scenes together, okay? I'm going to walk by each one. I'm going to stay as far away from my notes as I can and try to remember a lot of stuff, okay? So if I'm moving or forget something, no judgment. Here we go. All right, so the first place that we start with the Easter story where we pick up, uh, it's in the book of Matthew, and it is when Jesus prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, okay? So we've got the cup, the cup of suffering that we'll talk about here in a second and his hands around it. So we've got a verse, some scripture for each uh, picture that we're going to go through, each scene uh, that we're going to go through. So this first one, Jesus prays, Matthew 26, verses 38 through 39. He told them, Jesus told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little farther and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. So what we get in this scene right here is this is Jesus, and Jesus knows what's about to happen. Jesus knows of all of the things that are getting ready to unfold for him. And so he has this moment, like he says, his soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Jesus is more overwhelmed than I think just about every single one of us has ever been in our lives, okay? He knows what he's about to experience, and so he does the one thing that I think he sets the example for that we all should do when things get really, really hard or we're nervous about what's coming, is he goes to the Father. He says, God, this is gonna be really, really hard. And in his purest form of humanity, he goes, Lord, if there is a different way, Please make it happen. But if there is not, if there is not another way, then so be it. I trust you, God. And let your will be done in this situation. Let me take on this cup of suffering if it has to be that way. So Jesus has this moment. He knows what's coming. He knows he needs to go to the Father for strength. Also, another thing you get here that I just think is kind of funny but also terrible is that the disciples, right? Jesus goes back, says, stay here. Keep watch with me to the disciples. If you know how this moment unfolds, Jesus actually goes back and forth three different times to talk to God, to pray to his Father, and to check on the disciples because the disciples were asleep. Every single, can you imagine that? Jesus is like, hey, keep watch. And he's just overwhelmed. And you're like, you got it. You know what I mean? Like, we're here, Lord. We got your back. You know what I mean? I just imagine them waking up with swords out. Like, what's up? We're, you know what I mean? Every time, three times. I think Jesus used a little bit of like, they're asleep. I'm going back. He just knew. You know what I mean? This is a big moment. And it starts the whole story that's getting ready to unfold. So Jesus prays is the first scene. The second scene we have right here is Jesus is betrayed. Can anybody tell me who this is right here? In our second one. I'm going to come this way. You guys saw it over here? Say it. Judas. Judas, right? We know who the Judas is. We know who this guy is. Verse 47 in Matthew 26. And even as Jesus said this, Judas, one of the 12 disciples, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. They had been sent by the leading priests and elders of the people. So if you know this moment right here, Jesus getting a hug from Judas, this is a moment 
of betrayal. Jesus is betrayed by Judas. So Judas goes, and actually it happens when they're at the Last Supper, right? Jesus tells, hey, to the disciples, one of you guys is going to betray me, right? And they're like, well, it's not me, Lord. Who is it? Who is it? Judas is like, is it me, Lord? And Jesus goes, you've said it. And Judas takes off. And sure enough, he comes back, and he goes to the leading priest. He goes to all these guards, and he's like, hey, for a measly 30 pieces of silver, I'll tell you where Jesus is. Because the leading priests, the, the, the religious leaders of the law, they did not like Jesus, right? They were not fans of Jesus. They wanted Jesus gone. And Judas is like, give me 30 pieces of silver. That's it. And I'll show you where he's at. I'll take you to him. And that's exactly what happens. Judas shows up. They find Jesus praying. And he says, hey, the one I kiss on the cheek, that's the one you'll know. That's Jesus. So you get this picture right here. And Jesus is betrayed by one of his disciples. And that, that idea of the 30 pieces of silver just seems like a simple little detail in there. But like we really have to think about that for a second. Because 30 pieces of silver at that time even was not a lot, okay? 30 pieces of silver, I didn't just say measly to be disrespectful towards Judas, okay? I said it because it's a very real fact, is Jesus was betrayed for a, for a sum that was so small. It was that easy, that simple, that small of a reward in Judas's eyes that it was worth it to betray the king of kings. And so Judas does this. Jesus is betrayed, he is arrested, and he's taken to this council, which is our next scene right here. Uh, this scene is Jesus is judged, okay? So let's, let's read here, Matthew 26, 57 and 59, through 59. Uh, then the people who had arrested Jesus led him to the home of Cephas. I don't know how to pronounce that. Why can't their name just be like Joe? You know what I mean? The home of Joe, the high priest, where the teachers of religious law and the elders had gathered. Inside, the leading priests and the entire high council were trying to find witnesses who would lie about Jesus so they could put him to death. What a sentence. So Jesus gets taken, arrested, and he gets put in front of this council, also known as the Sanhedrin, right? And what they're going to do is they're going to try to accuse Jesus. Their goal is to find Jesus guilty of something because, like I said before, all they want to do is get rid of Jesus. Like they will, they're looking for any reason, anything that they can accuse him of to say, Let's get rid of this guy. Let's get him out of here. We're tired of him going around, doing his thing, teaching different ways than we're used to, showing different things, saying that he's the son of God. It's like, no, 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 this guy's got to go. And so they'll do anything, even to the point of lying. Finding people who will lie on a stand that is supposed to be built in trust and honesty and say, what do you know about this guy named Jesus? So this trial that they go to, Another thing about it that's really important to know is it happens at night. Like this whole span of things that we're walking through happens in like 12 hours, okay? It all happens very, very, very quick. It all walks through within a day's time, okay? But this moment right here, same night Jesus is arrested, they take him to trial at night. In Jewish law, a trial at night was illegal. So not only are they getting false witnesses, liars to sit on the stand, but they're getting this trial done at night so they can go unseen by so many others who are going to know and say, this isn't allowed to happen. So they do this first trial at night. Again, they are struggling, okay? That's why they're doing this. They are struggling to find fault in Jesus. And so they're trying to make a way. They are desperate to find a reason to get rid of Jesus. So they have this moment where Jesus is judged. And what happens right after, uh, before we get to this next one, what happens right at the end of this is it comes to uh, the leading priest going, hey, just answer my question. Are you the Messiah, yes or no? And Jesus goes, again, I love that he does this. You've said it. You've said it. And they all go crazy, tear their clothes. You know what I mean? How they do. I don't know why, but they did that. You know, they tear their clothes. They go crazy. And like, this guy's bad. And that's, that's their point. They're like, he said it. That's it. You're in trouble. And they all start smacking Jesus. They start mocking him. They start spitting on him. They start mistreating the king of kings. Then we go on to the next scene. Jesus is denied. So verse 69, Matthew 26. Meanwhile, Peter, my boy Peter, was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came over and said to him, you were one of those with Jesus the Galilean. But Peter denied it in front of everyone. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. This is a really, it's a, it's a weird moment for Peter, okay? If you know of this scene right here, uh, Peter actually goes on and he denies Jesus three times. Three different times. He says, I don't know who that guy is, right? 
And it, it's, it's just really weird because it shows of the struggle in Peter, okay? First off, the disciples scattered, okay? Peter followed Jesus, which is a really cool, loyal moment for Peter, right? He's like, he got arrested. I'm going. You know, he's like, I got your back, Jesus, but I'm going to hide. <laughs> you know what I mean? So he's like, he's walking and following the guards, following Jesus being arrested. He goes, he wants to watch, right? And you have this moment. He's sitting in the courtyard, and then a girl comes up to him and goes, hey, wait a minute. You were with Jesus. You're one of Jesus' followers. And Peter's like, you're tripping. <laughs> no, I'm not. He denies the Lord. So again, that tension, denies knowing him, that tension of like, I'm trying to be loyal, but also this is a really hard moment and I'm being accused of something and I'm scared. And so my answer is, no, I'm innocent. And like I said, he does this two more times. And if you read, um, I believe it's in in the Gospel of Luke, um, when this happens after the third denial of knowing Jesus, the rooster crows, right? That's why you have this beautiful rooster here. The rooster crows, And it says, this is a really cool moment, where Jesus and Peter make eye contact. It says, the Lord looked at Peter, and they look. You know, can you imagine that, like doing something? Because Jesus told Peter this was going to happen, right? On the way to the garden, Jesus goes, hey, I just want to let you know, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter was like, yeah, me? No way. I would never do do that, Lord. Sure enough. So Peter has this moment of looking at the Lord, and Jesus looking at him, and he goes, he was right. He said it, and it happened. I denied him three times. And so Peter, ashamed so upset with the decisions he's just made. He runs away in tears, just broken because of what he's just done. Our next scene, right? Jesus is condemned. Matthew 27, 22 through 24. Pilate responded. So this is Jesus on trial in front of the Roman governor, Pilate, okay? He's on trial. Pilate responded, then what should I do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? They shouted back, crucify him, Why, Pilate demanded, what crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, crucify him. This is a big deal uh, in this moment right here. We have one more verse, I think, right? Yeah. Pilate saw that he wasn't getting anywhere and that a riot was developing, so he sent for a bowl of water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. The responsibility is yours. So this whole scene, really quick, what's going on here is the Jewish leaders knew they could try all that they wanted to get rid of Jesus, but it wasn't actually going to happen. They weren't going to be able to kill Jesus and truly get rid of him without, some, that's weird, somebody of real authority. <laughs> Got me. <laughs> so, as long as no tiles fall, we'll be good. Um, anyways, back to Pilate. So the Jewish leaders... They see that there's no way that they're actually going to be able to get rid of Jesus. So they know we have to go to somebody who has authority. We have to go to somebody, a Roman official who can say and has the authority to go, that person needs to die and it will happen. Like we can say all these things, but again, we are struggling to really accuse Jesus of anything. So let's take him to Pilate. And our goal is let's convince Pilate that Jesus needs to die. So they go to do this. And of course, Pilate struggles, man. He's like, wait a minute. I'm going to be real with you. I'm struggling to see a reason why Jesus needs to die. I don't see what he's done wrong, right? But he also is like, he's got to be in this middle ground of like, I can't just like go this way because these people are going crazy and I don't want them to cause a riot. So, you know, first thing he does is like, he tries to get out of it a few ways. He sends Jesus to Herod. He's like, hey, you're from these lands where Herod is in charge of. Go take him to Herod and see what Herod says. Herod just mocks Jesus, sends him back, right? Send him back to Pilate. Pilate's like, all right, he's back. How about this? There's this, this moment while Jesus is on trial in front of Pilate and there's a prisoner named Barabbas. Everybody say Barabbas. Barabbas. Come on, Barabbas, right? So Barabbas is a murderer. He's like a revolutionary against Rome. He's done so many wrong things, caused riots and insurrections, all kinds of things, right? He's like, people see him as a bad dude. And so you see Pilate kind of try to get in this sneaky thing of like, here, I'll, I'll get them to get me out of this situation. How about I give you a choice, Jewish officials and leaders and citizens, You can take Jesus, and he can be innocent and free, or you can choose to free Barabbas, the murderer. Your choice. Immediate response, give us Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. We want the murderer over Jesus. And so that's exactly what happens, is they free Barabbas, and Jesus is kept. But Pilate is still in this tension space where he's like, I just can't, you know, he's got some counsel from his wife and other people, and he's having this really tough moment. He's like, I, I can't just 
demand that this man be crucified. I can't kill him. His blood won't be on my hands. So what he does is he, he washes his hands of the situation and says, hey, I'm not, I'm not going to condemn this man, but I will put him into your hands, right? So he thinks really that he's like, oh, I've got nothing to do with it. But if, you know, a lot of people would say Pilate had a big role to play in what happened next to Jesus, right? So the story goes on after Pilate washes his hands of the situation, gives him over to the Jewish leaders and says, do with him what you will. Uh, one thing Pilate does do right before this verse happens is he sends Jesus to be beaten, to be flogged. He says, I'll at least do that for you, but other than that, can't. So Jesus has just been beaten and flogged, and we pick up here, and Jesus is mocked. Our scene, verse 27, or chapter 27, verse 27. Some of the governor's soldiers took Jesus into their headquarters and called out the entire regiment. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. They wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head, and they placed a reed stick in his right hand as a scepter. Then they knelt before him in mockery and taunted, Hail, King of the Jews. This moment kind of speaks for itself, right? Jesus is condemned, and he's sent to be beaten and flogged and tortured in unimaginable ways. And right after that happens, they mock him and say, oh, you're a king? Sure, we'll make you a king. And they mock Jesus, and they make fun of him, and they treat him terribly. And, and, and one of the big things right here that we see um, is that they, they take him, and they, or sorry, verse 30, and they spit on him and grab the stick and struck him in the head. They start to beat him more. While they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him again, and they led him away to be crucified. But back to the other verse in the, the, the section before, they don't, this, this job of beating Jesus and mocking him, a handful of soldiers, maybe four, could have taken care of everything that they wanted to do. But they say, hey, you know what? Bring out the entire regiment. Bring out every single soldier that's here so they can see what happens to this guy named Jesus who calls himself a king. Watch what's about to be done to him. He's mocked in the biggest of ways. So like it says, they take Jesus on to be crucified. And this is our last scene right here. It's Jesus, is, Jesus carries his cross. So John nineteen seventeen, different Bible, right? Different book of the Bible. Uh, so they took Jesus away, carrying the cross by himself. He went to the place called Place of the Skull in Hebrew, Golgotha. So one thing to know, just something interesting about this is whenever, normally when, when the Romans chose to crucify somebody, they would have them carry the cross beam of the cross, just the place where your arm goes. They would say, you have to carry this up to your cross to be crucified, not Jesus. He said, no, 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 you can carry the whole thing. You're going to walk with the entire cross on your back. The tool we're going to use to kill you, the entire thing, you're going to carry it to your place of death. It's a hard place to stop for today, isn't it? Looking at these scenes and going, this is what we have for today. It's like a moment or like a, like a, a movie or a book. You ever had one of those movies or books where it's like, it's a two-part ending, you know what I'm talking about? Where you're like, the first part of the ending, the first movie in the series is like, uh, everything bad happens. And you've got to wait. You've got to watch the credits roll and wait and say, this was a terrible ending and everything's falling apart and I hate it, you know? Makes me think of, okay, here we go. Our Avengers Infinity War, any Marvel fans in here? Come on. You know, how many of you guys sat and watched that movie and at the end you were like, I can't believe this. This is insane. Like the dude, Thanos, the guy, the big purple guy with a really weird chin just beat everybody. You know what I'm saying? You're like, half the, wor half the world just dis He won. And there's frustration and you're like, no way. There's no way that that just happened. Right? You're like there's got to be more. There's got to be more to this story. Can you imagine? That's in a way different level. That's probably how all these people who follow Jesus felt. They're like, wait, wait. Did, did all that really just happen? Was he really arrested and beaten, tortured and mocked? Did that all really happen to the guy who was, he said he was coming to save the world. He, he didn't say the world was going to kill him. Can you imagine what's going on? Can you imagine the frustration that they're all feeling right now? Can, can we imagine what Jesus is feeling? No way. We've hit that moment where it's like, this, this cannot be the end. And it's hard to sit here with this and go, this is how it played out. It's a very hard moment to stop. But there's more to the story. Amen? Amen? We know, because we have the blessing to be in the future, <laughs> that 
that this is not how the Easter story ends, that there's so much more to this. And we're going to celebrate on Easter Sunday that no torture, shame, no brokenness, no pain, no crown of thorns, nothing, not even death itself, itself can beat Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Jesus Christ is king, and Jesus Christ is victory. And he receives the victory by defeating death. So we can see that. But today we have to stop here. Why? Why do we have to stop and go through this stuff? Why can't we move forward to the good part like Endgame and be like, yeah, he did it. You know what I mean? <laughs> Why do we have to sit here? The reason I think we have to stay here today is because I believe that there's something in these scenes right here. There's a few things from these scenes that actually is going to impact our view on the story of Easter in an amazing way. That it's going to show us and reveal to us some more appreciation for what Jesus truly did for us. These scenes aren't all loss. Because I believe that in these scenes, God was working. That God was already doing stuff for me, for you. And he wants us to know that because there's some, there's some health in there. There's some value there that we've got to see, that we've got to appreciate, that we cannot miss. And that really can change our perspectives on the story of Easter. So we're going to jump into that right now. Uh, and to start and to do this whole thing, we're actually going to take a look at two of these scenes specifically, okay? We're going to take a look at Peter's denial right here in the middle, the beautiful rooster. And we're also going to take a look at Jesus praying in the garden, okay? So we're going to start with the denial, back to Peter. So if you've been in church a while, we talk about Peter quite a bit, right? Peter just happens to pop up. He makes some choices that you're just like, there's Peter, you know what I mean? So we're going to talk about Peter a little bit. And I want to give you some background if you don't know who Peter is. A lot of us, we, we kind of go one of two ways, okay, when we think about Peter. Um, first group is like people who are like, oh, when I think about Peter, I think about Peter being like this awesome disciple. It's real. Peter was awesome, man. Like Peter comes in and he was a fisherman, right? Him and his brother Andrew. And Jesus comes to them and goes, hey, don't just be fishermen, be fishers of men, right? And he's like, okay, we'll do it. And Peter jumps in and becomes a disciple of Jesus, one of the first ones, right? Peter is also uh, somebody who walked on water with Jesus. Isn't that cool? Like Peter just like walks on water. Of all the disciples who are freaking out, like maybe he didn't last a long time, but he got out there, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's like, it's a, you, got, you got to give him credit where credit's due. It's like, hey, at least I stepped out, you know? So he's, he walks on some water with Jesus. And then also, just a little sneak peek for what we're going to get into later in the series, Peter is the person that Jesus says, on you, I will build my church. You will be the rock, the foundation. He calls Peter, Jesus calls Peter to lead the early church. That's insane. That's so cool. That's a big deal. Like, Peter is a rock star. Okay, we have to admit that. So some of us go there when we think of Peter. Others of us, like me, <laughs> because I, I like to relate to Peter, is when we think of Peter, we think of the not-so-cool things he did. You know what I'm saying? Let me give you some examples. Peter is the disciple who Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, too. Can you imagine a moment like that? Like you're just talking, he goes, get behind me, Satan. You're like, me? <laughs> like you just call me Satan. This is rough. He's also the disciple, or uh, one of the disciples, like we said earlier, who Jesus is like, hey, be alert. Like, can you imagine, like, Jesus is stressed out. You love Jesus so much, you just want to help him out. He's like, please be alert. I'm going to go pray in the garden. And they're like, we got him. You know what I mean? They just fall asleep three times. He's one of those disciples of the few that were there. He, he was one of the ones that fell asleep. He's also the one that when Jesus was being arrested, decided it was time to go full Jedi and slice somebody's ear off, okay? <laughs> like, the dude just is like, somebody's coming. Yeah, you know what I mean? It's like, sure, that's the natural instinct. And Jesus is like, let me fix that. Puts the ear back in you. <laughs> this is Peter. And like we're talking about today, Peter's also the one who on probably the most heartbreaking night struggles and makes the choice to deny knowing the Lord three different times. So some of us see Peter differently, but this is Peter. So let's look at this scene again, okay? Let's, let's look at this moment in the courtyard when Jesus is being judged. Matthew 26, uh, verses 69 through 70. Meanwhile, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came over and said to him, you were one of those with Jesus the Galilean. But Peter denied it in front of everyone. I don't know what you're talking about about, he said. For a lot of us, this is a very familiar scene. We've talked about this scene before. We've talked about Peter's denials. We just know that kind of growing up. It's one of those big moments, right? Especially for Peter, like probably the worst night ever. But I think, and what we're going to get into is maybe this scene is a little too familiar for us. Maybe we kind of know this a little too well, or maybe we think we do, that we kind of brush over it. Here, here's what I mean by this. I think we read this passage, and our minds automatically go, 
Oh, Peter, shame on you, man. Like you, you got to do life with Jesus, like right there in person. You watched him do all this stuff. Oh my goodness. How could you deny knowing Jesus? Like, you ever been there? You ever thought that? And you're like, wow, this, you know, I've, I'll be real. I've thought that. I've read that. I'm like, how does this man deny Jesus, you know? How, like, you can't be that scared. What's, like, I know, don't get me wrong, okay? I understand. We've all been in moments. I've been in moments where things have been really hard. The circumstance is tough. And there's a lot of things, just the worry, the nervousness, the anxiousness that pile on and just being overwhelmed. And they've led me to make decisions I shouldn't make. You ever been there before? And it's like, and I walk away going, just like Peter, I'm like, oh, that was terrible. I should not have done that. We're human beings. I understand. And yet we still struggle when we read this moment. We go, oh, Peter, why would you do that? Like, sure, I've done things, but I've never denied knowing Jesus. Like, Peter, come on, man. Can I be honest today? I've denied knowing Jesus. Can I be brutally honest today? We've all denied knowing Jesus. Some of you are like, hey, you better watch your mouth. You know what I mean? <laughs> Here's what I mean, okay? I, I, when I say that, I don't mean that you're literally just like Peter in the sense that you physically, vocally were like, I don't know who that is. It's not what I mean. What I do mean, though, is that we've all made choices like Peter where we choose something else over our relationship with Jesus. Because that's what Peter did, right? In a moment... Again, hard moments, I understand, but we have to call it what it is. In a moment, in a rough moment, Peter sinned. Peter denied knowing Jesus, and he sinned. Peter was a sinner. I am a sinner. We are all sinners. We have all denied Jesus. Whatever that looks like, we and again, we have different things going on. We've all done different things, but we've had moments where we go, I'm going to choose this thing and deny my true calling to pursue my relationship with Jesus in this moment. I'm going to choose this other thing over what God is actually telling me I need to be doing, what he's calling me to do as his follower. That's moments of sin. It's like I'm choosing the flesh instead of what God's calling me to. I'm choosing this in a moment of weakness instead of that. It does not mean that you've said he doesn't exist. It doesn't mean, I mean, maybe you have. Maybe you have straight up said, I, I don't follow him. And, and again, that's wherever you're at. We all have different places that we're at. But we've all been there. We've all been in Peter's shoes. Like, wow, if I'd have known you were going to say that to me, I wouldn't have come to church today. But I think it's so important. It's so, so important. And here's why, okay? It's really easy to overlook what we're doing. It's really easy to misinterpret and just have oversight of the decisions we're making and not see them as as big of a deal as they should be, okay? And don't say all this to beat you up. I'm getting somewhere, okay? Stick with me. But like, think about those moments that you have. Think about those moments where we say things like, oh, like somebody gets made fun of. Well, I just laughed at the joke. I didn't really say it. I didn't make fun of the person. I just laughed at it. It's like, so I'm innocent, right? I just watched the video online. I didn't, I didn't partake in it. I'm innocent, right? I just asked about the rumor I didn't really say it or share it or gossip about it. I'm innocent. It's like, it doesn't compare. They're so different. Do you see the comparison trap that we get into? This place of like, well, what they've done has got to be way worse. Like, sure, Pastor Ricky, I've done things, but it's not like what they've done. Like, sure, I've sinned, but I didn't deny knowing Jesus like Peter. This is a dangerous place to be. This is so dangerous for us. And here's why. Because when we get into this place, we forget this very important thing. Romans 3, 9 through 10 and verse 23. So I've got the three. We're going to jump to 23. Well then, okay, should we conclude that we Jews are better than others? No, not at all. For we have already shown that all people, whether Jews or Gentiles, are under the power of sin. All people are under the power of sin. As the scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. That's a hard truth right there. We are all sinners. And then verse 23, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. So why is this dangerous? 
Because sometimes if we get in this comparison loop, we say, okay, sure, maybe I've sinned, right? But mine doesn't compare to them. What we're doing is we're entering into this dangerous space where we're forgetting the most important point. And that is, we are all still sinners. Sure, you can get into a place, and I get it, man. Like, you might look at stuff and go, well, I haven't done what they've done. Like, there are people who have done terrible things. And because I said a little white lie, you're going to hold me accountable for it? It's like, here's why. Like, like it says right there, we all fall short of the glory of God. You know what that means? It means that because of sin, a distance is formed between us and our Heavenly Father. And that alone should be what matters. You, you guys get what I'm saying? I'm not, again, I'm not trying to like just bury you and just make you feel terrible, okay? I just, I, we need to understand this real quick because there's more to it. But the gap that sin creates should be the biggest deal. Because we can get caught up in the loop of like, well, it's not as bad as theirs, but it's like, but you're losing sight of the fact that it still exists. Your distance from your heavenly father is still there. And all you're concerned about is everybody else's. That's not what we're called to do. It's not gonna help us. It's not gonna help them. We've got to realize that even if we think differently about who did what and whose is worse, even if we haven't done exactly what Peter did, the gap between us and our father is still there and we should want to just eradicate that gap. Our, our heart's desire should be, I don't care what everybody else has done. I just want to be close to God. That's what should matter. I just want to be near to my Father who created me and loves me. That is what should be important. Okay, so what, what's the point in all this, okay? Because it feels like, Pastor Ricky, you just invited me to church today to tell me, hey, guess what? You're a sinner and you suck. You know, it's like, I'm not, it's not my goal, okay, at all. You're amazing and I love you. But there's something important here that we have to see when it comes to the choices that we make, when it comes to the fact that we are sinners. There's something we've got to learn that Peter experienced too, that we too have denied Jesus. There's good news, okay, in the midst of this. So to answer that question, what's the point? We're going to move on to our second scene, okay, in the garden with Jesus. So right here, back to the cup, right? Matthew 26, 38, and 39. Jesus told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little farther and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Again, Jesus went to the garden to talk to his heavenly father because he knew what he was getting ready to go through. He knew that this was going to be hard. And so he has that moment between him and his father of, if there's a way, I ask for it. If not, I trust you, God, and I know that you're good, and I know that it's what's best, so I'll go through it. I trust you. And as we know, the story unfolds like we just talked about, and Jesus has to go through every single one of those scenes and more. But why? Why does Jesus have to go through all of that? I just don't get it. Like, why does he have to be treated like, this is not fair. Why does Jesus have to do all of that stuff? It it doesn't make sense to me. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Here's, Here's the deal. Because of sin, there's a debt to be paid. Because of sin, there's a distance that's formed. Because of sin, something is owed. Because of sin, there's a cup of suffering that is to be poured out, like Jesus talks about. Let me ask you this, okay? Whose responsibility, who is supposed to be the person who stands in those spots? Who is supposed to be the person who receives the cup of suffering? Who is supposed to be the person who pays the debt? We are. Peter was. You see, when when Jesus was in the garden praying, stressed out, probably should have been Peter. When Jesus is betrayed by Judas and given a kiss, a terrible kiss, should have been Peter who was betrayed. When Jesus is judged and treated unfairly and lied about and mocked and spit on and should have been Peter. When, when, when Jesus is denied, Peter should have been denied. People should have said, we don't know him. That was Peter's spot to sit. When he's condemned and traded for a murderer, should have been Peter. When he's beaten and flogged and mocked like crazy, that was Peter's spot to stand. And it was Peter who should have carried the cross. Which means that was my spot. 
every single one of those is my spot to stand. Should have been. But Jesus stepped in. But Jesus stepped in. You ever got one of those, uh, whew, one of those letters in the mail? You're like, this looks like a bill. <laughs> and you open it, and it's like an unexpected amount. You ever had that moment before? I've had those before. You get a bill, you're like, I didn't know this was going to be a medical bill, something like that. Like, this is terrible. I don't know how this is going to work. Imagine that. There's a debt to be paid, and the truth is, is we're freaking out because we don't know how to pay it. And Jesus comes in, and he goes, here, let me have that. I'll pay it. That's what happens here. Jesus comes in and he says, oh, you, you should be real freaked out. Don't worry about it. I'll take that place. You should be betrayed. Don't worry about it. I'll let somebody betray me instead. I'll do that for you. You know what? You deserve to be judged, denied, condemned, beaten, and to carry the tool of your own death. That's what you deserve. But you know what? I'll do it. Because I love you so much. I will make those my place. Because here's one thing, we couldn't do that. We couldn't get through that. Jesus knows that because he cares for us. He says, I'll do it. I'll do every single one of those things for you. And you owe me nothing back. It's a free gift. Those were my places to stand. And Jesus said, Ricky, I'm going to pay it for you, dude, because I love you so much. And all I ask is just to do life with you. All I ask is to be in relationship with you. You don't owe me a single thing. The entire debt is wiped free in Jesus' name forever and ever and ever. It doesn't matter what you do, what you've done, what you're doing right now. Nothing will change the fact that I have defeated the sin in your life. Nothing will change that, ever. You're free for free. Jesus steps in. 1 Peter 2, 4 says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Because of Jesus, we're saved. Because of Jesus, we're free. Because of Jesus, we didn't have to stand in those spots. Because of Jesus, the, our identity, our, our, our title goes from a sinner, like we talked about with Peter, to a sinner, period, to a sinner saved by grace, exclamation. Good. A sinner saved by grace. And that last part, that's what matters. That's the most important piece. See, that, that's the goal here, okay? We're getting ready to be done. And you're, you're like, dude, this is a lot. You know, it's like, okay, what's the goal in all this? What's the point that you're trying to, to get me to understand in all this? Because it feels, again, like maybe I'm telling you, like, you need to make sure you're recognizing your sin. You better straighten up. You know what I mean? It's like, it's not what I'm saying, okay? I do think it's important for us to see the choices that we make. Because when we recognize that we are a sinner, we can realize our need for a Savior. When we recognize that we're messed up and that we do things wrong, we realize that those were our places to stand. And we don't realize that those were our places to stand to feel bad or feel condemned or feel guilty or to feel shame. But to realize that even though those were our places, somebody who loves us more than we can understand decided to step in. We remember all of that to remember how loved we are. We remember all of that to remember what Jesus did for us. We can't keep going through the motions of Easter. We can't go, oh, thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. I appreciate it. Sometimes we got to go, I can't thank you enough, Jesus. Because I deserve to stand in every single one of those spots. Those had my name written across every single one. But you wiped it out. And you put yourself there instead. Because you love me. Because you cared for me. When we remember what Jesus does for us, what he's done, it changes everything. Colossians 2, 13 to 14 says, you were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all our sins. Here we go. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. The goal is not for you to sit and dwell on your sin. The goal is not to say, remember how bad you are. The goal is to remember that no matter how bad you are, Jesus says, I'm enough. And he said, and guess what? It's nailed to the cross. I'm not going to look back at it ever again. You've been saved and you've been saved forever. And that's all that matters. We remember not to dwell, not to feel shame 
but to experience freedom and to remember the love that Jesus has for us forever. He canceled the record. He righted the wrongs. We do this to remember that the amazing grace of Jesus Christ will always be enough. Amen? And we're going to talk more about this throughout these next few weeks because he's got more in store for us. Can we pray together? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today. We thank you that we get to be here in your house, that we get to worship you, God. Lord, my heart goes back again and again to what you laid in my heart this morning, Lord, that, Lord, we are unworthy. And, Lord, we don't say that. I don't say that, Lord, to make anybody feel bad or feel terrible. I don't say that because I want people to think they suck. Lord, I just want us to remember, Lord, how good you are. I want it to be about you, Jesus. I want it to be about your love for us that no matter what we do, Lord, no matter what we've done, there's nothing we could do to earn it, God, but your love is available always and forever. Your forgiveness is available. Your grace is available, and it is enough, Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for stepping in our place, for paying the debt that we were supposed to pay, that we could not, for choosing us, for loving us unconditionally. We thank you for the love that you have that never ceases, God, that never goes away, that nothing else compares to. You are so, so good. And we thank you so much. Help us to remember, God, not to dwell, but to remember who you are and what you've done for us so it can mean so much more. We worship you and we thank you. It's in your perfect name we pray. And everybody said, amen.